Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, Hail King, of King of the Jews. Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify, Crucify him. him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have, we a, have law, a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you, if you release, release this man, man, you are no friend of the emperor. 
everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. Away, Away with, with him. him. Away with him. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have, we have no, no king, king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not, Do not write, write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not, us not tear, it, tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, he took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and their bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. 
And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. The world is full of beauty. Beauty is everywhere. There are rolling hillsides and lakes, warm and splashed with sunlight, in this the Finger Lake region. There is the soaring grace and strength of the cathedral at Canterbury. The tenderness of a mother cradling her child just born. There are flowers and the call of birds. There is the jostling and wondrous diversity of many cultures and ethnicities and colors of skin on a New York City street. There are symphonies and poetry and movies and literature. The elegant calligraphy on the walls of a mosque and the magnificence of this sanctuary we call our spiritual home. So much beauty. What on earth have we come here for? To gather around a cross on a trash heap on which the tortured body of a Jew dies, innocent of everything except compassion and love and a fierce determination to shake us loose from the attachments and preoccupations that keep us from the life that God made us for? There seems to be no beauty on this dark day, at this dark time. The outcome of a journey that started with some hope. There were signs of resistance early on, Herod, and the synagogue leaders of Jesus' hometown, and those enfranchised in the religious systems of the day. But there was hope in the journey of one who sounded again and again the proclamation of love. Love, the first word of God, who made us for love and the care of one another. Poor flourished as Jesus saw them, saw them for the human beings they were, and did not pass by on the other side. He saw the women, too, and the children, in a culture that sometimes relegated them to secondary status. To the sick, he brought healing. To the broken, the struggling, and the fear-filled, brought new hope. To the religiously self-satisfied, he brought provocation and challenge and a reminder of that to which the law points. Not an obligation for its own sake, but a call to live a life that embodies the goodness and beauty that comes only from God, who gave the covenant it was a provocation to be a people of love. Most of the religious leaders didn't see it that way. That provocation of those who had confused scrupulous self-justification with religion, in large part, led us to the ugliness on which we are focused today. And in a roiling political climate, with Romans to appease and themselves to justify, the leaders goaded the Roman leadership to crucify Jesus. Oh, and the Romans were more than happy to comply, to use their power to crush the innocent, as those in power usually are, if it buys them the cooperation of those on whose necks their boots are set down. We are often more than happy to comply, too, 
in similar situations. And so Jesus goes to the cross, a horrifying suffering to him, and a catastrophic and disorienting loss to his followers. Wasn't he God's anointed one? Didn't he only preach love and forgiveness and radical freedom to serve? How could this loss, this death, this grief be redeemed? It seemed the end of all hope. But of course it wasn't. There was something else going on here. Something an empty tomb a few days hence would open up with an astounding, elation-causing, joy-raising clarity. We're here now because that tomb would be found empty. Jesus would not be ended by the cross. That cross would not have to be redeemed. That cross would redeem us. Because it would bring to pass all that Jesus had been and said and done all along. That God's first word to us is love, and God's final word to us, death be damned, is love. A divine love so relentless and so fiercely committed to us that there was no length, there is no length to which God will not go to redeem us from our own worst. No loss it will not sustain or overcome. No catastrophe, it will not turn inside out into life. So behold the beauty of the Holy Cross. Behold the beauty of the cross, and do not look only on that cross at Golgotha. There are crosses everywhere, especially this Good Friday. There is pain and loss and fear in those around us, and they cry out. The poor and the disenfranchised are still crucified. If we are the people of God, then we can do no other than to carry God there in our own bodies. And as Jesus was life, we can be his life to others and find his life in being that for them. There are feet to be washed, wounds to be bound, griefs to be held, with those for whom they are too heavy to carry alone. Behold the beauty of the cross. And, dear people of God, be beautiful yourselves for all those in need of such wondrous beauty and love.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and, all, and the people whom they serve, for all those who meet in homes on these holy days, for those isolated due to illness or age, that God will confirm Christ's church in faith, increase it in love, preserve it in peace, and that all your people might be one. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and those to whom their care is entrusted for the President of the United States, the Congress, and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, first responders, and all who serve the common good. that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind. For the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those suffering with COVID-19 and its complications, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, selfishness, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, 
and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought out to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Gathering now our prayers into one, we pray as Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God forever and ever.